All of the teachings teach us how to create harmony within ourselves. And because of that intrinsic harmony, how to create harmony in the environment. So earlier this morning after lunch, I was thinking, well, what's the topic? And then they told me it's har creating harmony in the Sangha. And so I thought, what can I say? It could be anything. I could talk about karma. I could talk about uh, 10 virtuous actions and unvirtuous actions. Six paramitas would also fit very well. Uh, virtue and unvirtuous actions and merit would also fit very well. Lojong would fit very well. Bodhisattva Charya would fill, uh, fit very well. Madhyamika would fit very well. Vajrayana would fit very well. Any one topic could fit very well, as those are the golden rules that we could cultivate, which would create harmony. So which one? Which direction should we take? Should we take the direction of the parameters? Yes. Be generous. Be ethical. Be patient. Be effortful. Be concentrated. Be wise. And you create a harmonious Sangha. There are 59 slogans in Lojong. All of them would create a harmonious Sangha. There are 10 chapters to the Bodhisattva Charya Avtara. They could also create harmonious Sangha. There are the four immeasurables that could create a harmonious sangha. Or the three, re three jewels and taking refuge in them would also create harmonious sangha. Analysis and investigation of the true nature of phenomena and self would create, that understanding would create harmonious sangha. Knowing all appearances to be the brilliant radiance of your own mind and doing Vajrayana practices creates a wonderful harmonious sangha. All of those teachings, if we, won, if we not only understood it as a view, but truly understood it as that view contemplated on, and not only investigated and contemplated on, but you tasted the truthfulness of it, which is what meditation is about. Is you reflect on something, you analyze something until you find no escape from the truth of that investigation, from the truth of that view. That's the juice of meditation. That's the essence of meditation. So then that's why it's called. The fruition state of meditation is the generation of wisdom of no escape. That you can't escape from what is real, true. And so <coughs> such a sort of a profound, direct recognition of the view to be unquestionable, unchallenged, or something beyond a challenge, then that would then make it possible that you would cultivate it in your actions. If that kind of a penetrative insight that is a direct understanding of the view doesn't arise in one's own mind, until then action does and can seemingly be like a dictum, someone telling you what to do. But for a meditator who has truly meditated to understand that yes, this view that I have heard and that I have analyzed is something so true that it is beyond any doubt or hesitation, accurate. It is something true. And anything other than that, anything opposite to that would simply be my unwillingness to do it. But that if I were willing, it makes sense. It is something that has logic in it. It is something that is very true. And so therefore, how could I not do it? Then you confront your own laziness, which is the reason why one wouldn't do it. Or one confronts one's own attachment so strong because of which one wouldn't do it. And then because you recognize that the resistances are your own, then it's very clear that it's not a hurdle created by the other that obstructs your enlightenment. But it is habits, neurosis, tendencies of one's own that is the obstructing factor. So even if you were lazy, there would be wisdom of knowing laziness. Even if there were distraction, there would always be the wisdom that recognizes the distractions and the succumbing to the distractions, which even if you are lazy, even if you are distracted, unable to permeate the view in one's own action, I think is very good because that gives birth to one of the very important qualities, and that is regret. 
sense of seeing what needs to be cultivated, what needs to be abandoned, failing to do so, there's a little bit of regret. As long as that remorse or regret is there in the mind of a meditator, there's chance that your resistance will wear out. Where there is no regret, where there is no remorse at all for the negative habits, then you're complacent. And a complacency and the inability to see the need for change, that is one of the greatest obstacles in bringing about transformation and transcendence in the attitude of a meditator. So, uh, however, if, we want, if one is able to give birth to such an awareness, and then the closing of the gap of view, meditation, and action comes, I think that's very crucial that it happens. This is what we all practice for. And that's all what we are supposed to be doing. When you t enter into this path of practice, spiritual practice called Buddhism, it is understood that you are going to integrate view, meditation, and action into your life. So you have to ask, the first question that you have to ask yourself is, you know, why does this fragmenting of view, meditation, and action happen in one's own life? What makes it so very difficult? Because that whatever makes it so very difficult to unite view, meditation, and action is the reason why we do not wear out the habitual tendencies. And it is the giving in to the habitual tendencies that is the sort of factor that will always bring out neurotic behavior. And when we talk about how to create a harmonious Sangha, I believe we are talking about how not to create disharmony. So disharmony comes because of your anger, disharmony comes because of one's own attachments and desires, one's own ignorance, one's own jealousy, one's own pride and arrogance. These are, but these are not something that's just different from what we are sustaining as obstacle to, again, the same reason for not being able to unite, bring inseparableness to the view, meditation, and action. So the first thing what I would like to encourage all Sangha members is as I've been saying this since this morning, not to waste time, not to waste time imagining that uh, you can live a life so fortunate in having come this far with what you know, to now not bring it to a fuller maturation and a fruition of really personifying the best of your potentials. And so uh, be able to really develop an aspiration that using what you understand must be reflected upon, meditated upon, but most importantly, it must be evident in your habits, in your uh, personalities, in your attitudes, in your behavior patterns, in who you have become, your character, and what your character is like as an individual. The view of the Dharma must permeate within that. There is absolutely no other option. The other option would simply be here than what is often called spiritual materialism. Spiritual materialism is that. Is that besides actually embodying the view completely, when you bring in some other sort of pretentiousness or hypocrisy, then that is the birth of spiritual materialism. 